this collected auction and see if we can put a little bit there. In fact, we were talking about an advert originally just to advertise the event. And it kind of developed as most of my projects tend to do. They start off with little embryonic ideas and they grow into something. That's exactly what's happened with this auction and what happened with the film. Martin found, well, he already had a good archive of old Depeche Mode clips and he went and found a few more and added in some recall stuff. And in between all that, you know, I filmed some stuff at home and um, we put this documentary together. And it was a lot of hard work and he did a great job, I think. So I hope you like that. Um, and if you've got any questions for Martin, I'm sure he'd be very happy to answer them for you. So please fire away anybody who wants to ask anything about this other event. Why did you decide to do this? Oh. Okay, well let's get that out of the way. First of all, look, it's a number of reasons that, you know, it's quite obvious if someone holds an auction, pretty much why they're doing it. But there's a number of reasons for me. Um, I wanted to clear up some space. I mean, it started, as I've said many times, you know, about just reducing my studio, really. And I was looking around thinking, well, I never play this, I never play that, you know, this is just sitting there gathering dust. So I thought, well, let's, let's offload some of these. And then it kind of grew into something much bigger. And I thought, well, if I'm going to try and sell stuff, I didn't want to go through the whole eBay routine then having to package, take payments from people, package stuff out to everybody. It was just too much stress. I mean, it's been a lot of work anyway, of course, to put this together. So I thought, well, let's turn it, let's get uh, an auction company involved and add some more stuff. And I realized I had so much collected over the years. So many things. At the end of each tour, I would go home with a bag of t-shirts and tour programs. And I collected, I kept everything. And, um, I thought, well, this would be great to add into the sale and make it something a bit more special. So that's what happened. It just grew into this whole event. Um, I have kept a lot of stuff for myself. And I, there are certain things I wouldn't have come with. Very personal things. Uh, home videos that I shot on the early tours with the Passion Mode. I used to have a, one of the very first video cameras, you know, and I'd have it everywhere with me. So I've got all those things. One day they might see the light of day. I've got lots of photographs, I was always been sort of quite keen on photography myself, so I used to snap away and I kept all those pictures myself. I've got copies of every record for myself. I've kept some of the posters, some of the t-shirts, you know. So I've still got plenty of things, don't worry about me too much. <laughs> but I thought this would be a great chance for, you know, people to own something, perhaps, you know, present it or, you know, make it make it visible for other fans and something to talk about. And the process of actually preparing all this, cataloguing the items, photographing everything, was actually a very pleasure, even though it was hard work, a lot of people helped as well. It was quite a pleasurable process, you know, because I could look at, I did get something out of the box and say, oh God, I remember that show actually, and there's the tour pass. Fantastic memories. I've had to write down what every item, you know, research it carefully, work out what each item, where it actually came from, what it actually represented. So that whole process, you know, has allowed me to really enjoy the catalog. Maybe I would never have done that. So, you know, I, yeah, there's a few bittersweet feelings, but generally I'm very happy about it. Anyone else? Yeah, um, what is, obviously, Probably not for sale, but what, do you remember what was the first thing that you consciously collected during, during your whole Depeche Mode career? And also, what thing, probably you kept it, do you have the most emotional connection to of your artifact in this time period? Well, I, I probably already had a little bit of uh, the collecting bug even long before Depeche Mode, because I, I talked about this in the recent interview about how I used to collect football programs. And from the age of about eight or nine, when it would be taken to Queen's Park Rangers, my team. <laughs> and I kept all the football, you know, I was very enamoured with the, the, the freshly printed programmes and the floodlights. And, you know, the football was kind of almost secondary at that time. But I really wanted to keep the programmes. And then I would check the away team's programmes, you know, and I ended up with suitcase balls, and I still have those. And when I first joined the Mode, I, I guess, there was a lot of 
stuff happening at that time, you know, um, press articles. I mean, I've got a box of press clippings. They're not really, there's another thing that I've kept because they're kind of one-offs and very special. And so all the uh, magazines that we were suddenly appearing in, I would keep a copy of, you know. And then when we went, went on the road, I remember the first tour, which would have been 82 for me. The, I've got the tour program from there and some of the t-shirts. And some of the extra ones I've managed to find. There's some very old t-shirts in this tale here. Um, so I guess it started building from around that time. And, and as I say, every tour, every album, there'd be all kinds of paraphernalia that would go with it. And I just kept everything. You know, I'm, I'm quite an organised sort of person, you know. You, anyone who knows me and knows that I'm interested in the details. And, so I guess it's not, it's not unnatural that I would do this kind of thing. But is there that one thing in particular that would never ever sell that, would, that is your most treasured professional memory collector? It doesn't have to be something that's worth 20,000. No, I think it's photographs actually. Photographs, yeah. Yeah, photographs and films. I mean, the films can be shared, you know. But the photo, and so can the photographs, I guess. But, I, you know, I, I, I kind of like that as a personal collection. And maybe one day there'll be a kind of home movie film that we can put together from all those clips. I mean, you've seen some of them actually in the, uh, the remastered albums where the, they made some documentaries to go with the album. And some of my home footage, quite a lot of my home footage is actually in those films. I was persuaded to uh, lend those, you know, for the documentaries. But they're the things I treasure most, it's kind of the, as you say, it's not the big things really. It's the smaller, very personal things.
what I'm really interested in, in is how to put those together in a sort of clever way to create the atmosphere. And then he comes in later on. In fact, Paul, why don't you come and have a bit of a talk and tell I'll us a bit about later on. <laughs> Paul can tell us a bit about you know how he attacks what I give him, if you like. <laughs> First of all, I'm not a musician, so uh, what he gives me is music, and what I do is um, my my instruments are computer and plugins. I just love distorting sounds and uh, creating sound in space. I think that's. Uh, I come from a um, a headphone sort of background, so if I can make myself excited on headphones, I think I'm. You know, have achieved something. But it's it's not, you know, it's not rocket science. It's just put a plug in it and just just play with it. I mean I always played with effects when we, you know when we had studios to work in because the, the nature of making music has uh, completely altered over the last 25 years since I've been working. And it's not a great loss. Um, never really liked recording as such. I just like playing with noise. Alan gives me nice noises to, to play with them. I've got more obsessed with vocals as I've got older. Um, and to me that's you know that, that's really what gets me excited. You know? So and with Alan it's it, it's cool because there are lots of different vocalists, so each one can really uh, confront another thing. And it's um, yeah, it's good fun. But there's no real there's no real way of doing it. I mean it's just try and plug in try another one, you know, and it's got to excite me, the sound's got to excite me, it's got to, you've got to, Flood once told me, if you can't see a sound, don't record it, um, which is incredibly pretentious, but it's actually very true, um, so that's it, unless anybody wants any particular questions about uh, technology, don't ask me how to line up a tape machine, because I've completely forgotten that, but where's the bar? <laughs> I don't really know about that either. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, how you two got together in the first place? Yeah, I'm not sure. What? We get together. <laughs> well, if you want a really funny story. <laughs> okay, my, my first wife was an American singer. And she was a backing singer in a band called Fab Gadget. Who were on mute, so I'd met Daniel Miller and knew through her and it was at the time there was a big sort of revolution in technology and I just bought her um, 16 track analog machine and so I got in and Daniel wanted to buy the same sort of equipment set up a studio for me because it was getting very expensive just to go in studios and make records for, for bands that didn't sell any records. So I got involved with me and obviously because I was involved with me I met Alan. My and my ex-wife, for some Which reason, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> I'm still. Uh, my ex-wife got friendly with Alan's ex-partner, and they were going to go on holiday, and asked us if we would house sit for them. And he had this lovely house in the Kilburn Crickwood area, so we said, "Yeah, no problem." Unfortunately, the first night that we we stayed there, and Carol's, um, Alan's partner at the time was well into cats. One of the cats got out and got knocked down. So uh, it, it wasn't a great start, and the cat was sort of walking on his front two paws, or legs, whatever they were, and the, the back half was completely totaled. And he couldn't pee. You had to express, I found out a new word, express the, whatever, pee, urine. And I can vividly remember when Aaron and uh, his missus came back to the, to the house after their holiday. And I just couldn't speak. I was, you know, this was Alan Wilder from Depeche Mode, and I just virtually killed his cat. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's how we met. <laughs> now, after, after that, I mean, he, he, what happened was we... Did you sample like that? Oh, that's really nasty. <laughs> The, um, we didn't work together for a long time because I, I, I would always work with all the um, artists that didn't sell on me, you know. And 
and um, but he did a he did a when he was just started doing a recoil. I bought a little Pro Tools rig, which was quite unusual at the time. And we worked on a remix together, and I sort of showed him the Pro Tools, and he seemed to like. It. And um, that remix went quite well, so you know, we've been working together pretty much ever since, just after our sound methods and that. Or would you want me to start? Do you want to hear about the second one? I can't talk about the third. Any, uh, any personal favourite tracks in the history that you like? From Record. What's your favourite mode track? Favourite mode track? Uh, what about Black Sabre? Remember when you came out to Atlanta? Oh, no. Don't like it. When you came out and you heard Black Sabre? Yeah, yeah. They sat me down. We, we had this problem getting into Berlin. It was before the war came down. And we ended up in East Germany um, on the way to Poland, which wasn't a good idea. Um, but we finally got there after being sort of um, strip searched and having the van searched for, uh, I don't know, gun running or something by the, by the East German police. And we were really frazzled being the, the guy that was driving. You were coming to collect, uh... We were coming to pick the gear up and take it back to London, yeah. And so Gareth, Gareth Jones, he said, yeah, you guys are really stressed, aren't you? So, uh, yeah, sit down, smoke this big fat ball batty and listen to the album, man. <laughs> so I had the absolute pleasure of being completely stunned listening to the first ever full playback version of Black Celebration in Hansa Studios, where it was mixed, and it was just wonderful. I mean, uh, you know, it's, back in, it's just a great memory. But um, my favourite mode track would probably be something like, um, what's that one? I like, uh, you can't do the thing. no, I don't, I'm not very good at that. Uh, probably, per, personal Jesus, sort of, there's a, there's a rocky one. Uh, what's the one with the really nice eyes? Uh, stripped, stripped, do I like that one? Yeah, there was another single. Don't pretend you don't know. No, I really can't remember. Think. Rico. Yeah. <laughs> I had some money for that. <laughs> um, recoil track, uh, that's difficult. Um, yeah, I don't think I've heard one that I actually like yet. <laughs> 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 no, that's totally true. Um, no, I mean, they're all, they're all good in their own way. I mean, I, it's very difficult for me to, to be objective about those because obviously I've worked on them. You know, quite a lot of them. So I tend to hear the mistakes in the mix rather than just listen to it as a piece of music. Which is a general problem when you work in the studio. You don't listen to music as a you know, somebody that loves music. You listen to it as a you know, as a technical person, and that's you know, that somehow ruins the experience and, you know, and pleasure of music. That's why I listen to Frank Sinatra. You know, it doesn't threaten me. So, yeah. What's your favourite? Favourite mode or um, recoil? My, my, my favourite mode tracks are Walking in My Shoes in Your Room, Never Let Me Down, Stripped, Person Jesus. I guess they're the obvious ones, really. Um, the, I think the Violator and So Fed albums are the albums that I'm closest to, and, and I feel we did our best work on, particularly So Fed, just because it was. It's a more intense listen, it's a more detailed, layered kind of sound, and that's what I'm interested in. And some of the songs are more mature, I should say. So, and the recoil stuff, well, I kind of, I'm a bit like Paul, it's difficult for me to pick one particular track. There's songs on each album, or tracks, that um, I heard, uh, what did I hear the other day? I thought it was really good. Supreme, I heard again. And it sounded very fresh to me. Um, but of course, uh, things like uh, Luscious and Drifting and Strange Hours, you know, you know I, there's things about all of them I'm keen on, of course. Do you, do you prefer the post, the personal recall stuff to your... To Definitely, your... yeah. I mean, pre-mode recall stuff was, as everyone knows, a kind of side issue. Lines, right? so, yeah, a lot of people like that album a lot. I guess it's a bit more poppy, a bit more commercial than perhaps my difficult other music. But, um... But it's much, what I do or have done since I left the band 
is much more developed, more focused. And I think from the point that I brought vocals in properly to contribute, then I was able to focus the music much more, knowing I had a kind of a top line, as it were, rather than just making endless instrumental music, which is nice, you know, but it doesn't always fulfil what you want. So, uh, yeah, from Unsound Methods onwards, I think it's been proper music you know, for me. Most what person? Most influential of oh. music for most motorists throughout the seven years. Um, you must be very proud of that, I feel. Well, it's not for me to say what the influence is, but um, people have said very nice things about what I meant to the group, you know, over the years, and it's always flattering to hear that. And I'd like to think I contributed something important to the group. And my aim always, when after I joined, was to try to make this a bit more serious sounding. You know, in the early days, there were times when I was highly embarrassed about how twee everything sounded. Rich um, Yeah, go on. Rich Clark. No, no, not Vince. I think Vince is alright. Now, I think the general approach just wasn't um, hard enough for me, for my taste. So, my ambition really, once I got involved in the production team, Starting really from construction, but, but later on when I was able to take more of a role, perhaps from Black Celebration onwards, my ambition there was to give us a bit more depth, you know, a bit more longevity, you know, you could listen to the music, find new things in it, and um, it wasn't so disposable. So I've always tried to bring that to any music, really. My favourite albums are always that way, you know, you can listen time and time again and, and you hear something you've never heard before in them like Lou Reed's Berlin or the White Album or something like that, you know, where it's always something new to be found. How did you anticipate the first album It was a bit difficult to say what would happen because of Dave's particular personal state at that time was, you know, as we all know, pretty tenuous, you know, and I think there was a time after I left when I know Martin's spoken about it and Fletch has spoken several times whether they weren't sure if Dave was going to make it through that album and they had a lot of trouble, I believe, recording his vocals for Ultra. And there were some attempts made that they had to just sort of throw away because he just wasn't in a fit enough state to do it. Um, so the fact they got it done and got through that period was an achievement in itself. And in fact, I think from all the posts my period mode albums, that's probably my favourite actually. Um, I think Ultra does have some good songs on it and it has a kind of atmosphere about it that perhaps the other don't have. Apparently the one's got you written a lot, but I thought the first heard that bass that you wrote. Which? Apparently the one. Well, I wasn't involved in that. I think that's what I'm saying. When I heard that first time, it definitely sounded like you might have Yeah, it's not, that one's not so far removed from what has been happening. Well, yeah, it wasn't so far removed from the Sofa album, was it? No. And in fact, they've gone further away from that ever since. So the more recent albums? Well, the more recent albums, they're kind of a mixed bag for me, you know. So, you know, I don't want to stand here and sort of say too much about what they've done since, but I think they've done some good and some not so great stuff, you know. Um, but it seems that they've moved into a slightly different realm, you know, perhaps Martin's influence is greater than it was when we were all together. Perhaps, you know, he preferred more electronics and, and I prefer a mixture of electronics and samples and grittier sort of sounds, but, you know. Okay, do you have any um, feedback from the rest of the touch now about what you're doing here today? Actually, no, really, I know, I'm sure they're aware of it. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure they're aware of it, but uh, no, I haven't had any feedback. Martin will be bidding online, he may well be, he may want that guitar back. <laughs> He's got two other guitars exactly like that, just so you know. And about another 30 or more. I didn't notice any leather skirts. No leather skirts, no. Could you tell us a bit about the audition? Um, you know, for the patch? So oh, yeah, now we're going back. Actually, I did two. Story. Yeah, I did two auditions when I first joined the patch mode. Actually, I had three because my first audition was not really an audition, it was a meeting with Daniel Miller. 
and he was there in his little office in Seymour Place where Mute first existed. And he, he went through and vetted uh, each applicant so that I had to, you know, convince him that I was worth being auditioned. So I had a chat with Daniel, and then I think a week later he said, okay, the audition take place, you're in, you know, come to Blackwing Studios, and uh, I think they saw about 20 people that day, and they asked me to play Just Can't Get Enough riff, I think New Life riff, and, uh, and then they said, oh, he can play it, you know, and they said, can you sing and play at the same time? So I played the riff, and I sang a backing vocal at the same time. Pretty impressed. And I was thinking, oh, this is the easiest audition I've ever done. Anyway, so they saw about 20 people that day, and then I think about a week later I got called again saying, well, we can't decide between you and this other guy. The, apparently the band liked me, but Daniel Miller liked the other guy. And the other guy, I think, had a song or two that Daniel had heard. He thought, oh, that's quite good, you know, a piece of a song. So I had to go back, both of us two went back for a second audition and then they made the final choice of, of me, you know. Who's um, the other? Hmm? Who's the other? I don't know the name of the other guy. I have no idea. Carol Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Well, as you can probably uh, would have seen, you know, the, visually, the visual side of what we do, is particularly since we've been out on the road, myself and Paul, has been very important, you know, and it's been, I guess it's the only way I could really find to present Recoil in a way that didn't look too boring, you know. It's pretty difficult for us to, even though he does his dancing now. In fact, uh, we don't need the film anymore, do we? And uh, we're going to play for you later, you know, so you'll see some of this spazzy dancing later. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the home of bed, isn't it? <laughs> so in the future, I'm sure we will use some more films. There's several people, Martin included here, who are very willing to help and make films to complete the record music, which I'm very happy about. But when we next go on the road, apart from a couple more shows we're going to do this year, I think I'm going to have to find a different way to present the whole thing, which we'll probably still use film, but you know, in a, in a different way to what we've been doing, so it's not just too repetitive, the same old thing, you know. And that's a bit difficult for me to conceive at the moment. I'm not quite sure how to do it yet. So I'll give it some thought and try and come up with something interesting. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's difficult. I, I felt quite self-conscious at the beginning of our tour. Um, in fact, the time I felt least self-conscious was when I was drumming with Depeche Mode because that was the most challenging thing for me to do on stage. I had to kind of teach myself to play before that tour, and so I had to really concentrate during every song to make sure I did things right. Whereas sometimes with keyboards, you know, you can kind of switch off and just do it. And on what we're doing here, because we're trying to do um, quite a cost-effective tour and very simple production so we can quickly go to places and set up and do the shows, it's a fairly minimal setup. It's more of a presentation than a real live band. And so at the beginning of this, this tour, I felt quite self-conscious, not it's seemingly to do very much to the laptop and a synth, you know. But over time, I've kind of relaxed about it and got into it and realised, you know, you just have to enjoy the music, enjoy it enjoy what you're doing and I try to relax and have fun with it, you know. Um, but I'm not a real natural performer, I'm not desperate to get on the stage. Isn't it? And if you were to make big venues with tens of thousands of fans or smaller venues? I think the smaller ones can be more intimidating. You know, once, once a venue gets beyond a certain size, you can't really see faces, you know. At the point where you see the faces and the expressions, that can be can have an effect on you, especially if someone's yawning. Tonight. tonight, well, you look like a fairly nice place. So. <laughs> I think we'll be all right with you lot. But we played the Vintage Festival down in London last uh, a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? And that didn't have a recoil crowd. The tickets were too expensive. It was the wrong audience. It was the wrong kind of setup. And and there, you know, you could see people going 
what's this? You know, a couple of people walked out. And, and that kind of puts you off. But that doesn't happen too often, luckily. You did a, a gig in Manchester, this April with Newman. Yeah. Yeah, I'm using that tonight as well. That's a that's a VCS3 ah, okay. English synthesizer. synthesizer. Uh, yeah, that's what that is. It's just the synth that Eno used to use with Roxy Music, you know, the, when, he, when he still had hair. Yes. And um, and what we tend to do is we actually in the studio, Paul and I quite often use that particular synth to feed many sounds through because it has such unusual filters and envelopes. So you can you can send a sample sound into that synth and treat it, use it as an external effect. Um, but it's quite an unusual one, it has a little joystick on it, yeah. and pins that you have to put in to create the patches. And... You play battleships on it? No, you could, you <laughs> could. <laughs> you want... Yes, sir? Did you have much control over the remixes in The Depeche ones? Yeah. Actually, I was only there as a real, really as a consultant. Um, they were mixed up at the Mute Studios, which was called Worldwide, I think, at the time. Um, maybe not. But anyway, they were mixed in the studios, and I would go in kind of late in the day. Uh, they did come to me to get some of the original sounds, which were missing, and I, of course, being the collector, had the sounds on a DAT. So they came to me to get the rest of the sounds, and they managed to find most of them on the original multitracks, transferred everything into a digital format, of course, Pro Tools, probably. And then they were mixed up to a certain stage, and then myself and other uh, consultants like Flood or Gareth or Daniel <coughs> would come in specifically to say, yeah, this is close, no, that's wrong, let's have a bit more in the back speaker. So I did that kind of thing, but I wasn't there for the whole process. And um, I think they gained mixed results. I wouldn't say every mix was great, you know, um, but certainly a lot of them were much clearer and you could hear what was going on. And, you know, we, we actually the only 5.1 album I've ever done is with Paul for Subhuman, and we set that up in my studio, hired in some extra equipment, and that was quite pleasurable. Really, wasn't it? And that was good fun to do. You've actually answered my second question, because I was going to ask what second yeah. albums um, in particular on in the Depeche ones. Yeah, on the Depeche one, that's the question. Final mm. three going into question Yeah. There's a little marching band. Yeah, train spotter. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what happened to them, they marched off, never to be seen again. It sort of goes off into the distance. Yeah, no, see, if I'd have been properly involved, I would have found that marching back. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. 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 That some would change and some would reappear. Mm. I didn't realise that they didn't have access to the entire thing. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Do you also do you do anything with say um, circuit bending? Which is that? Circuit bending, you know, where they take all the equipment from the digital and, and they rewire it and you get itchy and things like that. No, I'm not so familiar with that stuff at all. No. Mm. Mm. It sounds like with some of your stuff you've done it, but you obviously did it. Digitally, not, not with the that's glitchy sound, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's him. If there's any funny noises, look at him. Glitching, you know, horrible digital distortion. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the guy. Yeah. I, would, I said to him, can we have a nice clean sound, Paul? And that's what he gives me. That's what he gives me. Do you still stay in touch with the person that? I've had um, quite a bit of communication, more, probably more communication over the last 18 months than for the previous 10 years um, because I was involved in the remix for them and also we did that show at Albert Hall so, and Martin came and DJed at one of the uh, recoil shows so I guess I've spoken to them quite a lot really over the last uh, period, yeah Would you get back? <laughs> 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 How long 
did it take? <laughs> not bad, yeah, not bad. <laughs> just <laughs> help yourself, <laughs> just, <laughs> just had to do it. <laughs> Next. <laughs> yes. What's Paul like to work with and vice versa? Is Sorry, I can't hear you. What's Paul like to work with and vice versa? <laughs> King Nightmare. <laughs> That's what he said. I guess. As long as you get him some nice marks and specs, as chocolate biscuits, what else do you like? Cheese, toasted cheese sandwich, cup of tea. Has to be strong, no sugar? No sugar, see? And vice versa. Hey, cricket for me in the background. But that's the video. What do you like to work with? Yeah, we, we cross over on uh, cricket and football interests. We have different football teams, but, you know, we both like sport. So, uh, he's not bad to work with, you know. but. As he kind of explained, he has certain areas that he, he really focuses on. Like, but I'm very pleased to have folk, uh, Paul take over with vocals, and in particular, he'll go through every single vocal line. We try not to compress and limit vocals too much. We're getting technical here, but it's quite important because um, it makes a real difference if you have a, um, with the digital technology, you don't need to stick vocals through lots of cheap effects or even good ones, really. Just to get the vocal to sound even, you can go through individual lines, lift individual sections, pull down S's and T's that tend to pop in the mic, you know. You can deal with all that stuff first hand, and this is what he does brilliantly, you know. So you end up with a, a voice that sounds really, really present, really, really close, and right in your face, you know. And then we might apply some reverbs and effects if we want them. But I'm, I tend to sort of, these days, like drier and drier voices, so they're really clear and focused. So that kind of detailed work is something Paul does really well, plus, as he talked about, the sort of unusual, more digital type of effects, you know, he's got millions of plugins, isn't he? And, um, all paid for. <laughs> I doubt it. So, yeah, he's all right. Which, uh... Better audience in America or like your Better audiences? Yeah. I think if I had to choose my favourite audience, I'd say the Latin Latin countries, South America. I'd say the um, Russian, Germans, Eastern Europeans, yeah, tend to be the most vociferous, you know, they're the ones that and it's not it's not a surprise really that the countries that have been starved more of good music over the years are the ones that appreciate it the most, you know. American audiences would be a bit laid back. The British are not great, you know. The uh, English audience is the most difficult to please. And um, so we enjoy going to places like Moscow and uh, Budapest, yeah, Budapest is great. Um, Slovakia, you know, Czech Republic, Poland. They're all good. Um, well, we, we only played a few shows in Eastern Europe before 1989, around that time. Um, they were always crazy. We played in East Berlin, I think it was 86, 87, 86, 87 was it? Yeah, and that was a mental show. You know? And I think we played Warsaw, a few others, you know. Pre the, pre the Iron Curtain, but um, but those countries are still very appreciated now. You know, they, they remember what it was like. You know, a lot of those people remember that they couldn't get access to music, you know, <coughs> or, or the majority of music. So they they still remember those times. system with trying to be available, trying to be, to communicate first hand via email or the website or blogs or Facebook and I've welcomed people in that want to contribute something like Martin here and, and many other people, Igor, who did the Love of Life film um, and there's many others, you know, and the thing I like best is the proactive types. People that come to me, they don't just say, oh, well, then can I do something? But they actually offer me something and just say, look, I've done this.
to your music, or I've made this bit of film, or I've done this website, you know, have a look. And um, quite often I see something that, well, wow, that's really, you know, that's a good piece of work, you know. And then I kind of try and get involved, say, well, maybe you'd like to help on this or that. And so I've got, I managed to get a really nice team of people around that have all been very willing and helpful. And I appreciate it a lot. I haven't really, not, 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 well I've done a bit of that production for, for Night's Red, yeah, um, what, that one album, but I realised even though, you know, we're good friends and we didn't fall out or anything like that, it was still quite hard work at times and quite a lot of emotional investment into someone else's project, which sounds quite selfish, but you've got to, you know, I'm the kind of person that doesn't do things by halves. So if I decide to do something, I go all the way with it and, and I'm only satisfied if I've put everything into it. So that takes a lot out of you and if you do an album, or produce an album for someone, you could be talking about a year's work. So I tend to sort of stay away from that. As you know, I've done an occasional remix. Um, I find that at least a little bit easier to deal with. You haven't got to deal with all the, you haven't got to babysit anybody. You know, when we're producing other people, is. It's a whole scope of different tasks to have to be able to perform, and it's not, and many of those are not about the music. They're about dealing with people and marriage counselling and all these things that go wrong between band members. And, and I don't want to be involved in any of that. I just want to focus on the music, you know. So a remix is much easier because you just get sent the stems or whatever the parts are, and you just do your thing. You know? So I don't mind doing a few of those. You surprised with Dave? I wasn't totally surprised. I was pleased that he found the confidence to do it because Dave had been talking about being a songwriter when I was in the band, and, but had never, to my knowledge, once actually presented a song. He'd say things like, yeah, I've been working on a couple of tracks, Al, you know, and we would say, oh, let's hear them, and you'd never hear them. And it was just about his own personal confidence. And then he obviously came to a tipping point probably when he was getting cleaned and all that, where he thought, well, no, I've got, to, I've got to develop the confidence enough to present these, and I think at that point he gave some songs to Martin, and, and ever since then he's been more and more comfortable writing songs, and that's good for him. Great. No, I'm not surprised. I mean, he's got good people around him as well. I mean, he'd be the first to say he does, he's not the greatest musician, doesn't play, plays a bit of guitar, but it tends to be kind of noise effects rather than chords. He's not, you know, a player, but he's got people around him who've helped him with the chords and putting the music together, so I'm not surprised at all. Football. Yes. Paul, do you want to take this one? He wants to know your feelings on the Arsenal. Do you can eat? Okay, I'm in front of Go on. Manchester, I love you. <laughs> yes, I'm an Arsenal fan. So what? <laughs> so the blue Manx nicked one of our best players, and the red Manx just humiliated us. And uh, where are we going to finish up? Uh, the Arsenal finish up in the top four. Pretty sure. <laughs> and the score between Kipiano and Murder. I mean, that, you know, they're, they're, I'm afraid. As much as I respect the man, his football team. <laughs> I mean, really, they've just bought our left back off us, you know, and he's, he's really useless. And he used to carry around a nut and dust this kid, a little French kid, he's, he's mad. But yeah, he should go down uh, well in the uh, Loftus Road. <laughs> Alright, well, I guess we'll leave it there. Um, have a great time. I'll uh, introduce the auction when it starts at three just to say thank you again, but I uh, appreciate this and I hope you're enjoying it and uh, I'm not sure, I think they're leaving that room open for a bit longer if you still want to look at any stuff. And so, uh, thanks a lot. See you later.